right now we're going to be focusing on um, why businesses need a crowd. And I'm going to be joined by two individuals. I'm going to bring them up individually and I'm going to talk to them um, uh, uh, for a few minutes to sort of dig into their respective stories. Um, um, each of them are incredibly unique um, in regards to how they got to where they are today and the role that crowdfunding and crowdsourcing has played in terms of helping to kind of accelerate their own businesses um, uh, you know, over the course of the last few years. Joining me first is a, a really good friend and uh, uh, a little bit of a legend of the New York tech uh, industry and I'm really, really excited and really proud to, to have him today. Um, so joining me is uh, Josh Abramson. Josh, come up onto the stage. Josh is the... Uh, Josh the, the, was previously the co-founder of Vimeo, uh, College Humor, and, uh, and now is the CEO of Busted Tees, his most recent venture. And uh, has, despite his boyish good looks and, uh, and, and age, has an enormous amount of experience, um, really having started his first company back in kind of the, 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 the 1.0 days and, and lived through that. and. Um, built and, 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 uh, and run multiple businesses that have all harnessed um, a number of different sort of forms of, of um, crowdsourcing and collaboration and user-generated content. And I think it's going to be fascinating to get Josh's sort of perspective. Um, after Josh, after we have a conversation, I'm going to also bring up John Foley, who's the CEO of Peloton, um, to hear from him. And then following that, we'll open up to a more general discussion and obviously also bring you guys into it as well. So Josh, welcome. Uh, great to see you. Um, so what I'd love for you to do first, um, are you, did you press your little green button on the side? You did. Is it green? It is green. Excellent. Okay. Can you hear Josh? Josh, be turned up. All right. Well, we'll continue regardless and you may have to project. Okay. We're good. So um, Josh, what I'd love for you to do for the, for the benefit of our audience is to um, really just tell us your story in terms of um, how you started out as an entrepreneur. Um, getting into kind of the, the digital media space. Sure. Um, so uh, the first company I started was collegehumor.com. It was 1999. I was a freshman in college. Um, the idea sort of came to me because my brother was working at um, an early, uh, was working at advertising.com and told me about these huge checks he was sending to these very silly content sites that um, were just getting a lot of traffic. So the idea came from, you know, what can I do to build an audience online and, um, and in turn make money on advertising? So that was where College Humor was born. Um, I started it with my best friend from high school, um, continued to grow the business you know, for the next four years while we were in school. By the time we graduated, um, the business had reached a scale where we were comfortable not going and getting real jobs. So, um, and by that point, we brought on two other partners. Uh, you know, at that point in time, we weren't really sure whether College Humor was the business we were going to you know, be successful with or if we were going to start some other things. So we were kind of throwing a lot against the wall. That was how we started Busted Tees um, and also Vimeo. Um, so this is like 2004, 2005. Um, then in 2006, we sold all of those companies together to IAC um, in a deal that was essentially, you know, the idea was that we would sell half the company, um, well, 51%, which actually is quite a bit different as it turns out. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, for the next couple of years, be able to grow the businesses together with access to a lot of capital and that sort of thing. Um, so that was, again, that was 2006. Um, I stayed with them for about five years um, until two years ago this May when I bought back uh, the Busted Tees business, which um, you know, was just sort of, had become sort of, uh, you know, stepson um, or orphan child at, uh, you know, within our company where um, just wasn't really a focus of our parent company. So I was able to buy that business back um, and have been focused on that for the past two years as well as having launched a new site called tpublic.com, which um, is probably the reason I'm here <laughs> because tpublic is really, um, you know, the idea was originally to build sort of a Kickstarter for t-shirts where we were, um, you know, crowdsourcing design um, and then, you know, sort of by you know, making it so that in order for a, a shirt to get made, it had to reach a, a threshold of 30 units sold. Um, and then designers would make $5 for every shirt that was sold. Um, you know, that was sort of the idea initially, um, which has worked in some ways and not in others. So I can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we'll, we'll, de we'll definitely get in that, into that. So let's go all the way back to uh, the dorm room days as you were starting to kind of, you know, conceive of your first businesses. There's a kind of common thread that runs through a lot of the uh, earlier ideas that you have with, you know, College Humor and, and, and Vimeo in, in particular, and then obviously later Busted Tees, which is that content 
um, in particular content that's created by your users and then essentially um, um, used to be able to uh, secure advertising dollars was kind of core to the business model, right? So can you just like talk a little bit about where that insight came from and um, why you felt uh, in those early days it was just so important to getting the business off the ground? Right. Well, it's funny, you know, the, the reason that we decided to go in the direction of comedy initially, um, you know, as I said, our, our first instinct was we want to build a, a media business. I didn't know it was called a media business until many years later, but that was sort of the idea. Um, you know, create content or, you know, uh, you know, aggregate content and then sell advertising. Um, and I made a, a, an early form of a blog. It was like a GeoCities page, and this was like my second month of college. And um, we're just like taking all the funny pictures and stuff that we were kind of taking of ourselves, you know, freshman year of college. And, uh, and got a couple thousand visitors on this blog that was just like, you know, a very, you know, thrown together kind of thing. So that was sort of where the idea came about. Well, what if we actually, you know, built a site specifically for this and aggregated content from everybody's dorm room? Because everybody, you know, especially like you get to college, like you do stupid things and you take pictures of it. And it was right at that moment when people really started to do that. People started to have digital cameras and, um, and people now had you know, access to a computer at their dorm room. And, and you know, for a couple of years ago, it really hadn't been that way. So it was sort of a, an interesting moment. Um, and that was, you know, really how College Humor was born. We were, you know, we sort of seeded it with our own content. And then, um, you know, the community just sort of built upon that. And um, I think with Vimeo, it was very similar, where, you know, my, uh, my partner who kind of invented Vimeo, uh, his name's Jake Lodwick, and he sort of, you know, had this problem he was trying to solve. Um, and kind of went and like came back after spending like a weekend locked away and just like was like this is a Vimeo thing I built which is pretty cool and um, but he was also you know he was a filmmaker and he was making kind of you know, very early versions of you know video blogs and, and that sort of thing and and wanted a place you know to be able to upload them and, and make it easier for other people to do the same and I think you know in much the same way that you know a content on college humor stemmed from you know the the content that we were making ourselves the content that you know, sort of populated Vimeo in the early days was, was very, you know, similar to the content that, um, that Jacob was making and that, you know, our close friends sort of living in New York and, you know, the kind of you know, filmmakers that we had, um, you know, just become acquaintances with. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's interesting to see, you know, sort of how the, the early content and, and early, you know, actions by people in the community sort of, you know, people tend to copy what they've already seen. And, and that's, I think, you know, a big reason why Vimeo today just sort of feels like it's it's you know has a creative class element at its core and mm -hmm. you know Blair YouTube you know less so right I think uh, it's a, such an important point there which I think translates to the crowdfunding conversation as well which is you know the the best platforms the best user generated content platforms have often been built by people who are content creators first built the platform second and then the kind of the the, the user generated component came sort of after that and i think to a certain extent it's true in crowdfunding it's like you shouldn't really ever ask someone to back your project if you're not someone who backs other projects at the same time and perhaps that's just a a philosophical kind of way of looking at it, but I do think there's something kind of interesting in that in regards to kind of how you guys originally got, you know, the various different businesses off the ground. I mean, you know, College Humor was, uh, a, a, you know, a, a project that started with you guys creating funny content yourselves and then just looking for somewhere to put it. Mm -hmm. And Vimeo was created by essentially a filmmaker who was mm -hmm. just trying to fix a, a certain problem. Yep. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, you know, and fast forward to, you know, launching our new site, T Public, and you know, we've thought about, you know, just very hard how we seed that content originally, like what kind of shirts we want to, you know, encourage people to make and kind of, you know, having been in the t-shirt business for almost 10 years, sort of have a good idea of like what sells and what doesn't. So by sort of seeding the site early on with designers that we kind of handpicked and got them, you know, to engage with the platform, um, we've seen, you know, exactly as we expected, the, the type of people who are who are joining and are uploading designs or are doing things that are very similar to what's already there. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it, it's it's certainly hugely important. And um, you know, and I, I guess you know, I would say that it wasn't really. I mean, it was very organic. We didn't like plan to do all these things this way. I mean, it's one thing now, you know, when I'm starting a business today, but you know, with College Humor with Vimeo, that's just sort of you know the only way we knew how. So it, it was. You know, fortunate that we did it that way, but sure. you know, it wasn't like a conscious decision or anything. So uh, I, I want to dig into um, 
a little bit more of your story in, in a bit. In particular, I want to sort of uh, spend some time focusing on some of the decisions you made along the way in regards to actually how to capitalize the business and how to kind of fund the business and accelerate the growth of the business, um, you know, both through traditional and non-traditional means. But before we get into that, I'd like to invite John Foley uh, to also join us on stage. So John um, is currently the CEO and uh, founder of a company called Peloton. Uh, fascinating story uh, in its own right, um, and I'd love for you to sort of tell that story. But before you do, just give us a little bit of background um, uh, on who you are, in particular the sort of path that you took to starting your own company and, and Peloton in particular. So I started a little bit different than Josh did. I was uh, <coughs> out of college. I went to Waco, Texas in a manufacturing plant, kind of the opposite uh, <laughs> uh, sexy entrepreneurial thing. Um, I then uh, didn't like manufacturing, uh, and I was drawn to the tech community for all the dynamic, exciting reasons. So I jumped ship in, in 1996, went to City Search, um, which was a hot, fun company um, in Los Angeles, um, where I stayed for three or four years. Um, I then went to business school, then went, uh, came back and ran evite.com. Um, I then left evite to found a company called pronto.com, which was in the comparison shopping engine space. Um, uh, at the same time, we were founding a company called Proust um, with Tom Cortezzi, a buddy of mine. Um, and then I left and went to Barnes & Noble, ran barnesandnoble.com. Um, so I'm quite a bit older than Josh. <laughs> you can't tell. Um, if looks didn't point that out, obviously. Uh, but uh, a year and a half ago, um, do you want me to transition into Peloton? Um, a year and a half ago, I uh, had an idea. Um, if you guys are familiar with Flywheel or SoulCycle, this kind of um, uh, booming um, boutique indoor cycling um, culture um, in New York that's kind of spread around the world. Um, and I became obsessed with the idea of how, how can you bring that to a home? How can you have group cycling experiences in your, in your house? Um, and in order to uh, do that, we realized that you had to build a totally vertically integrated uh, ecosystem, which was, uh, turns out to be pretty ambitious and hard. Um, I'll fast forward and tell you I tried to raise venture money, and 20 out of 20 of the top venture capitalists said, thanks, but no thanks. So um, it was a, you know, it's, a, it's an ambitious project where we're actually building a bike in Taiwan. We're building a tablet computer in Taiwan that sits underneath the handlebars. It's four times bigger than your, than your iPad. So it's an immersive, projective, capacitive glass touchscreen. And what we're doing is we've also written all the software on the client side, the Android uh, stuff, and then the cloud video streaming stuff so that um, we have a studio here in Manhattan and we stream the class to your home via this integrated ecosystem. And uh, so it's kind of a fun, cool thing where the energy of the class comes to your home. Your friends through Facebook Connect, you can compete with them. You can video chat with them. It's this big, immersive, cool indoor fitness thing. And the idea uh, stemmed from being at Barnes & Noble where I saw Amazon and, and uh, Barnes & Noble building Android tablets for $250 and then selling them to the consumer for $150. So they're subsidizing the cost of the hardware with the digital content business model. So we're doing the same thing. We're building this thing for you know, uh, over $1,000, but we're, we plan to sell it over time for well less than $1,000 because the business model is subscription digital content. So that's kind of, it's an atypical business. It's different than a lot of things you guys are working on, but that's kind of where I am. Uh, and is it true you've been banned from multiple soul cycle classes in the city because uh, you're you're a little bit of a competitor? Is that right? It's funny. I, I, I'm going after the indoor, uh, the home indoor fitness equipment uh, space, but um, Soul Cycle and Flywheel have decided that I'm a competitor, so I can no longer go to these classes that I've loved. And I, it's kind of a funny. I go to Barry's boot camp. Oh, I, I heard it was because you were too good. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it might, might be what I told you. In the awesome. Project. So uh, there's an aspect of this story that I, I'd love to get into, which is, which is really, really interesting. So you got turned down by like you know the top 20 VC investors uh, in Silicon Valley, and they looked at the business and they said too high risk, not interested, not going to touch it. So faced with that rejection, you know, what was the next uh, immediate opportunity for you? Can you just tell us a little bit about how you managed to kind of raise the initial fund? Yeah, uh, so I, I raised $400,000 last January from my very close friends and family. I then got into this project and said, we're going to do this. And I thought that I could go raise traditional money because I'm 42 years old. I sold Pronto for, you know, some amount of money to IAC as well. 
And uh, so I thought I was a proven guy, so I thought that they were going to be excited. And t to your point, uh, Toby, they said, no thanks, because it's such a hardware component. And you know, a lot of them just say, we don't invest in hardware. And not, uh, um, but we're trying to do two pieces of hardware and open a spin studio in the local community. They just said, this seems n not like the, you know, I think they're looking for the next, um, you know, uh, Instagram where you, you know, put a couple hundred thousand dollars in. So, uh, but to, to your point, to your question, Toby, um, after raising money, if you don't raise the next round, you basically have to shutter a company, if, you know, if you need capital to keep going. So I went out and they said no. So I had to do it the old school way and go and pick, you know, bring my pitch deck around to everyone I knew and everyone they knew and everyone they knew. I, I think I pitched 500 people in 100 days and I raised money from 65 individuals who on average gave me a $60,000 check. So we ended up raising $4 million, but it was, you know, you know I, I was joking with Toby, it was old school crowd financing. It was going to a bunch of people and, and trying to find everybody who they knew. But um, we ended up doing it, but it was because I had to. Now, I believe in this product and uh, believe in the opportunity, but um, wasn't able to raise money the way I wanted to originally. So, uh, so you get to the kind of the four million, and uh, obviously, I can only imagine what sort of slog that was. Um, although, actually, sort of going back to the earlier session we have about refining the pitch, I imagine you have your pitch down at this point um, after after like a hundred or so it's consecutive uh, pitch meetings. Um, but after that, so you know, you've got your initial kind of um, a chunk of money, and, and to a certain extent, you could have just like you know run with that, launch the business, get it off the ground, capitalize it in whatever way that you needed to. Um, but you didn't, and you chose a, a, an additional fundraising kind of mechanism to, to help support another aspect of, of starting the company. So can you right. talk about that a bit? Yeah, I, I've become a super big fan of, of crowdsourced uh, project financing. Um, we did ours on, uh, ours is actually still live on Kickstarter. We have six more days left, but we've, we're funded. We raised close to $300,000 of basically pre-orders, <laughs> as you guys know these platforms as well as I do. But uh, to, to your question, Toby, um, these platforms allow you to launch your business before your product is really available. Um, they allow you to get a ton of marketing excitement, you know, the video, the, the pictures, the story, the, the whole thing. Um, it also allows you to prove a market. So, you know, uh, a couple hundred people have bought our bikes on this platform. So they've said, yes, we want this product. So that's, you know, validation. Um, and the, you know, the $300,000 actually helps. It allows us to go to our, um, our manufacturing partners pay for the tooling, pay for the non-refundable engineering, pay for the initial orders um, without coming off balance sheet or actually having to raise incremental money and coming out of equity. So the crowd helps us place that first order. So uh, we're, we're really excited about uh, the success on Kickstarter. How long was the campaign? Well, how long has the campaign been running for at this point? Twenty-five days. Twenty-five days. Three hundred thousand dollars. And how many backers? Uh, close to 300. Close to 300, okay. So a, an aspect of the campaign I just want to get into, then I'm going to kind of o open it up for a broader discussion. So, so when you launch the campaign, um, you know, there's this sort of like idea that somehow you sort of put the campaign out there. If you have a glossy video, people will kind of, you know, pick up on it, it will go viral, and then you'll be golden, right? Um, the reality, of course, is that that's rarely the case. Someone pointed out earlier that 60% of projects do not get funded on the Kickstarter platform. I'm sure that's probably true of most crowdfunding platforms. And so if that's the case, you know, what needs to go into the actual design of the marketing campaign behind um, um, you know, launching a, a crowdfunding campaign of this kind? Yeah, so we launched our campaign and basically said that's when the work starts. Um, unfortunately, the people that are generally on Kickstarter are younger, they're, they skew male, um, and they don't have a lot of money. So projects like Ouya and Pebble that are priced at $100 that are geared towards 20-something you know, techie guys do fantastic because they are already on these platforms. We're going after a 35 to 50-year-old woman who a lot of them still haven't heard of Kickstarter. So to your question, Toby, we had to start marketing as soon as we launched, and we did the old school web marketing that Josh and I cut our teeth on, which is you know, uh, display, uh, search, uh, social media, um, email marketing, um, buying emails, uh, buying ads, and you know, uh, uh, traditional press. Um, so it's kind of a novel product and very interesting in the fitness space, so we got some good press. But you're right, it's, uh, it's not launch your, your platform and, or your, your program, your campaign, and cross your fingers. It's kind of 
get it out there and then bring your own crowd to it, people who you think are going to buy your product. And for us, it was a lot different than the people that are already on Kickstarter. And, and, and final question to that, um, having, as you say, cut your teeth on more traditional digital marketing kind of campaigns, how would you compare the two? Um, would you say it's, it's the same, different, uh, f like fundamentally different? It'd be interesting to sort of get a, a kind of com compare and contrast on that. Yeah, the, the, the fun thing about being on Kickstarter is people like uh, Kickstarter, people like uh, Indiegogo. They're fun, cool, new things where just being associated with them versus, you know, the alternative is put your website, have pre-orders on your own website, don't pay the 5% to Kickstarter and drive traffic to, to that, to your site. We made the decision that being on Kickstarter it has such a f cool cachet that it, it, your, your brand kind of drafts off of that coolness in the community in a way that uh, I think reflects well. If, if Peloton, if you think about Kickstarter, it's, you know, it's a great association for us. So um, thinking about the sort of the question of, of why you know, businesses need a crowd at this point. Um, going back to you, Josh, for a second. Um, over the course of the last sort of few years, have you built the various sort of different businesses, and, you, and, you, and as you have um, looked to finance those businesses, um, sort of what what has really informed your decision making along the way in regards to how do we grow the company? Um, how do we bring more finance to the company? How do we accelerate you know, that growth? Like, what, what's been some of the major things that have, um, have influenced that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was fortunate that I started a, a you know, business that I was able to build with one other person um, in our dorm room. So we really, we had very little expenses um, for the first several years. So by the time you know, we actually started to have real employees and real expenses, we had built a pretty substantial business where um, you know, our, our cash flow was so positive. You know, it just never even occurred to us that we would have had to raise money. Um, when the time came to eventually sell our business, you know, it was sort of, in truth, we sort of thought about it from two perspectives. First, it was a liquidity event, which everybody wants. But the second was, you know, we weren't really sure how much capital we were going to need. And by doing the deal that we did, um, at least it seemed at the time that we would be able to sort of, you know, go to the well quite frequently if and when we needed it and we had you know, the projects that were um, you know, deserving of, of extra capital sort of opportunistically. And you know, that certainly was the case with Vimeo, where um, before we had sold our business, you know, Vimeo was, um, you know, it kind of looked like it did today, but it was you know, maybe 1 million users versus 100 million. Um, so uh, you know, we didn't really, you know, and also there was a lot of, I think the reason why you know, Vimeo is Vimeo and YouTube is YouTube, even though you know, Vimeo launched before YouTube, but we were very conscious of the fact that um, you know, there was a huge expense in the serving and, and, um, and storage of, of video and high definition video, um, not to mention the fact that you know, our experience with College Humor taught us that by putting um, you know, copyrighted material potentially on a website, you were going to have a lot of lawsuits. So we were very restrictive with what we allowed users to do in the beginning, um, and then sort of watched as YouTube you know, with zero restrictions kind of you know, became YouTube in a pretty short amount of time. Um, but you know, when we did decide that you know, Vimeo was interesting for reasons that were different from what made YouTube interesting, um, you know, we were in a position where we were able to, you know, because we'd already you know, sold a, a, you know, half of the business, we were able to um, you know, go and, and then hire out a team and, and have the money sort of at our disposal. Uh, it's sort of interesting because I think that you know, most entrepreneurs are faced with some like, critical decisions along the way um, in regards to kind of you know, <coughs> how to grow the business and, and what to do when faced with those like, liquidity events, which you know, can sometimes seem like amazing opportunities and you, sort of, you, you live for these moments. Um, but sometimes, you know, they either don't come to fruition, or if they do, they don't pan out in quite the way that, that you were hoping. Um, and, and I just sort of think that those decisions um, need to be informed in some way. Um, and obviously, there is no hard and fast rule. But I'd love for you to sort of share a little bit about sort of your thinking at that time and how that thinking has changed subsequently. Sure. Um, well, at the time, you know, I sold my company when I was 25, so I was obviously pretty young, um, didn't, you know, I had a lot of really smart people that were advising me, but had not really lived through enough to have a, a good perspective on sort of, you know, what signing up for five years meant um, working for someone else or, you know, some of those types of decisions. Um, and I also sort of took for granted the, you know, 
part of the reason you build a business, um, at least for me, you know, the way I think about it today is so that you have something that you enjoy doing every day. Um, and I think, you know, obviously everybody wants to make a living, and, but I think beyond that, once you get to a certain point, I think what makes your you know, day to day more enjoyable is actually liking what you do. Um, and I think, you know, when you have a business that you've started and it's your baby and then you sort of hand over the reins to someone else, even if you're still CEO and you're still running it day to day, obviously there's, you know, while well, they don't happen immediately over time, you know, you're, you're just in a different place and, and it's not, you're no longer the entrepreneur, you're now sort of an executive at a public company or who, you know, an employee of a, you know, private equity fund or whatever it might be, um, or at least that's sort of what it begins to feel like. Um, so I think, you know, I certainly didn't, I, I may have not placed as much of an emphasis on that as I would today. Um, but also, you know, having been through that process once and, and having the luxury of, you know, not needing, you know, having had a liquidity event or, or, you know, not really needing to worry about, like, tomorrow's paycheck, I can have a longer term view and, and not really have to, um, you know, build a business specifically for the sake of, you know, having an exit. Mm -hmm. and, and John, you know, sort of similar kind of line of questioning for you really um, uh, w did you feel it was like out of necessity that you had to kind of go down the path that you went down you know even taking into consideration kind of the the, the initial earlier rejections from the sort of the West Coast VCs has it always been out of necessity or, or, or has, has it been sort of partly by design um, it has been out of necessity to be honest um, but uh, to, uh, to Josh's point, I am happy the way that, that things have played out because I don't really work for somebody like I might if I have taken big money from a big VC where you actually, you know, they put in all kinds of covenants and, and uh, caveats where, you know, it's their company eventually. So um, because I have 65 investors, none of them have that big of a voice. They're all my friends and family, so they, they are very involved in a, in a fun way. But from an you know, entrepreneurship perspective, I like the way that it's worked out. But I, I would be lying if I said I wouldn't have taken a 4 or $5 million check from one person uh, last year. Mm -hmm. Well, that, I, I think there's something kind of interesting about both, both of your uh, stories in that respect. Because um, you know, ultimately, what you are hoping for in these sort of situations is kind of a degree of freedom and, and flexibility and the ability to choose the direction of your business because that going back to Josh's point is probably going to impact how fulfilling you've how fulfilled you feel and how enjoyable life is ultimately as an entrepreneur uh, the less wedded we are to people that uh, are, are going to start to kind of interfere and, and muddle in your business um, you know hopefully the, the, the better things will be as a result um, but I'd love to ask a kind of question which is you know sort of a, a, in a 2020 hindsight kind of, of question, which is um, starting with you, John, um, with the 4.3 that you've raised to date, four of which from 40 individual investors and the rest from 300 plus um, sort of crowdfunding investors, um, if the SEC had ruled and crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding was possible today, would you... Uh, have still gone after those 40 investors, or would you have gone to a platform and done a raise instead? I probably would have gone to a platform, to be honest. I, I think done well. I'm excited about um, that. That's you know partly why I'm, I'm here. I, I think this crowd funding model, whether it's reward based, I've, I've talked to Toby on the phone, he's educating me on all the vernacular, um, whether it's reward based or equity based. Um, I think it's it's the future and and. and Again, you, you, you prove a market, you get marketing, you get people excited, and if it allows you to also help fund your business, whether it's through equity or rewards, I, I'm convinced that it's the way entrepreneurs are gonna be able to access capital um, and ideas, good ideas will bubble to the top in a more of a meritocracy way than some VC sitting across the table and deciding your fate. I mean, it's, um, why don't you take it to 100,000 people and see if a thousand of them get excited about it. So uh, I'm excited about the future of crowd, crowdfunding. What, what do you think a world would look like today, though, if you were the CEO of a company that had, let's say, a, a thousand individual um, e equity investors in your business? I think one of the beautiful things, and I'm, I'm reaping the benefits from this now with 65 investors, but I'd like to have 65,000 investors, to be honest. Um, what you do is you get uh, evangelists. You get people who are, have skin in the game. They're excited about your success. They talk about their involvement. They, you know, all over the world, they're 
you know, your brand ambassadors, they're investors in your company. It's a, it's a fantastic community that the more the merrier for most consumer products. Why, don't, why, why wouldn't you want to have you know, so many people who have skin in the game, who are rooting for you, who are going to read your emails and buy your products and talk to their friends about it? I, I, I think it's a fantastic future for this entire um, you know, crowdsourced project financing or however you call it. And, and, and uh, there's a million different ways, and I think it's any one particular way. And for you, Josh, um, you know, do you see a, a big difference between um, the crowd and crowd investment and, and, and those that back projects versus customers? I guess, you know, part of what we've seen, you know, I, I think Kickstarter is great, as I think, you know, we can all agree on that. Um, and, you know, having spent a lot of time selling t-shirts and, and realizing, you know, what a good business it is and, and seeing how many designs, you know, we were coming across on a daily basis or designers that we, you know, had a relationship with that had, you know, a, you know, they would send us this catalog of like, here are like the hundred shirts that have never been made and like they're all just really great. So um, that sort of, you know, got the wheel spinning. Well, how do we sort of create a market for all of these designs that exist that people just don't really have a good platform? Not everybody who makes t-shirts wants to go, you know, build a t-shirt company like I've done. and you know, other people don't necessarily want to even, you know, put their things on like Cafe Press or, you know, some of these other sites that are out there that offer similar services, but, you know, it's not, if you're like a really, um, you know, more high-end designer, you're, you might not be comfortable on this platform. So that was sort of the, the initial idea. Um, but the thing that we sort of failed to realize, I think, in the, the, you know, sort of crowdfunding element was, you know, you look at Kickstarter and you look at the campaigns that are successful and sort of the, um, you know, like some good friends of mine are building an underground park um, or trying to on the Lower East Side and they had a very successful Kickstarter campaign. And I think, you know, it, first off, it's a, it's a super cool project. I think everybody, you know, can, um, can agree on that, but also can, you know, feel like when they're supporting it, it's something they can kind of brag to their friends about. And it's really like, and people take ownership over those types of campaigns where, you know, you're, you're funding this thing and then, you know, the first thing you want to do is talk about it. And it's, it's the act of funding that I think for a lot of people is, you know, it's more about the sizzle and less about the steak, um, which, you know, is great if people can, if you can get people excited about supporting something that is, is good. Um, I think, you know, for a t-shirt, it's a little bit less, you know, exciting for just one, you know, the idea of, um, funding a shirt just because you're like supporting that designer, you know, is not as much there. It just doesn't have as much meat on the bones. So um, while it's worked for us to get, you know, a lot of people excited about the platform and, and people, um, you know, to sort of, you know, to contribute to our catalog, um, it hasn't worked as well as we had hoped with regard to just people sort of naturally gravitating towards wanting to fund a design. What actually happens is once a shirt gets funded, they're much more likely to buy it because they just want the shirt. They're not as interested in sort of, you know, facilitating a creative process or some of these things that maybe we, you know, kind of romanticized in our, you know, meetings <laughs> before sure. actually launching. Okay, so a little short on time, but I do want to take a couple of quick questions if that's okay, very, very quickly. Yep. John, how did you get around the fitness carve out in Kickstarter? It says no fitness or exercise. Yeah, we uh, we stressed out a lot about a couple of the different. Um, there's a subscription component um, up to our business that we kind of had to obfuscate, um, uh, which we worked around, and, and Kickstarter was happy with our workaround. Um, but to your point, they do say no fitness equipment. I think, to be honest, they're worried about the you know the plastic belly burner where it's just some simple novelty fitness product uh, of a new style of weight or something. Um, that's not that uh, sexy or, or complicated. For our business, we, we put our business into the product design category, but we could have put it in the technology category. Um, it feels like this style of project, and we rolled the dice and you know made our video around Kickstarter, and it paid off because they did like it. But we did have a lot of anxiety about that. Um, the, the one fun thing for all, for all of us um, is that there are other platforms now. So we you know, went after Kickstarter because we think they have the best brand in the space right now, and I think they have the most traffic. But um, uh, we you know, felt good about the fact that there's you know, a couple Indiegogo and a couple others that you could go to if Kickstarter rejects you. So it's not you know, one bite of the apple. Uh, there's other games in town. Cool. One more question. Just say. Uh, 
Yeah, it's hard. Uh, it's hard to compare because we launched our business on Kickstarter, and so we don't have another another data point. But uh, um, return on investment, as far as the time and money, which is material to do the video. I mean, to get to the prototype um, is expensive, and then to do the video and take the time. You know, it's not a um, putting together a blue chip uh, Kickstarter campaign isn't a couple hour thing. It takes weeks, to be honest. Um, is, there, is, am I is, is there a is it possible to sort of share a little bit around kind of like you know percentage wise based on what you've raised to date? You actually have had to kind of invest into the campaign, paid media search, etc. Um, it's small to be honest. Um, I think we've probably spent twenty thousand dollars mm -hmm. all in. We bought a. Uh, um, well and good. Uh, NYC is a fantastic blog uh, or a media company here in New York that has access to our target demographic. So we paid them for a dedicated email. Um, the, the good thing about uh, the evolution of social media and online advertising in general is it's so targeted. So you can buy people on Facebook that like particular brands. You can buy <coughs> keywords, obviously, on Google, specific things. So it's a pretty efficient uh, ad spend um, mm -hmm. that we were able to. So it wasn't you know, um, throwing money uh, against the campaign. And, and Josh, maybe just to sort of like round off the session, like what are some of the efficiencies that you are now experiencing with Busted Tees um, you know, around you know, the return that you're seeing from um, you know, from a marketing perspective, but also through you know the various different sort of you know campaigns that you run. Sure, I mean you know to answer the question as far as you know sort of what our return on crowdfunding is, or you know, I, I really think it's it's hard to really calculate because it's really just a question of you know how much are we spending on development and all that we're doing you know in terms of you know product development and sort of fine tuning the site and making it easier for people to share. I think that all sort of gets grouped into that bucket of you know what we're doing to just encourage you know people and designers who are. Um, engaging with the site to sort of be our marketing. Um, so I guess that's sort of, you know, all of our development overhead. But then as far as like other channels, you know, I mean, we're pretty, you know, Busted Tees is a pretty, you know, traditional e-commerce business. So we're doing, you know, all the, you know, SEM, um, you know, affiliate. Uh, we don't really buy ads except for, you know, through networks and retargeters and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, everything that we do, we're pretty concerned. You know, we're not like um, being, Super aggressive, where we're spending to this like insane lifetime value, hoping that we become a billion dollar business, and then we start to make money. You know, we're actually making money through all of our channels. So everything that we do is, is profitable. All right, cool. We have to wrap it up. Please join me thanking John and Josh.